Welcome to The Real American Revolution. My name is Randy Flood, and today we're talking with Dr. Larry Ferreira, author, Brothers at Arms. In this episode, we'll be focusing on the roles of Spain and France in assisting the Americans achieve their independence. Larry, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be here. Brothers at Arms provides a unique perspective of the American Revolution. What led you to write this book? I'm a naval architect by profession, so that uh, certainly was an interesting way to get into the subject. Um, I was posted to um, the United Kingdom, and while I was there uh, going through all of the archival material, I found that Spain and France had together formed a combined navy in the, mid of the middle part of the 18th century to specifically to defeat Britain. And I further discovered that it was that combined force, that combined navy, that really proved to be the key to the Americans with their uh, French and, and Spanish um, partners in winning the War of American Independence. You make the case that it was not just France, but France and Spain allied together that were vital to our fight for independence. Could you explain why those nations would come together to form an alliance? In the 18th century, um, the alliances in Europe were fluid and constantly changing depending upon who held the balance of power. Britain was always considered to be the adversary of many of the European nations, especially uh, countries like France and Spain who were fighting for not just dominance in Europe, but dominance in the empires across the globe. France and Spain did not have separately navies that could compete with Britain on the open oceans for imperial advantage. Remember, the mm -hmm. colonies were mm -hmm. across the Atlantic and the Caribbean all the way to Asia. Britain was an island and it could sink most of its money, military power, into the navy because it uh, was protected from invasion. Neither France nor Spain had that luxury. They were land powers. Mm -hmm. They had to uh, reinforce their armies. They had very little in the way of naval power by themselves. So in any contest with Britain, it was always going to be about um, naval might. Mm -hmm. France and Spain um, decided that uh, together um, they could operate well against Britain, not only because their two navies could uh, consolidate, but because the f kings themselves, the monarchs, were both descended from uh, Louis XIV. That mm -hmm. meant that uh, the king of Spain, at the time Carlos III, and Louis XVI, who was the uh, king of uh, France, were cousins. Mm -hmm. So the compact, the alliance between the two, was not just a military alliance, it was also a family compact, that's actually what it was called. And in the letters between the two monarchs, you often saw the phrases, my dear uncle or my dear mm -hmm. brother, um, as they communicated back and forth. And this was the Bourbon dynasty, This correct? was the Bourbon family dynasty, that's correct. France was humiliated by Britain during the Seven Years' War, which of course we called the French and Indian War here in America, losing all of their North American possessions and diminishing their role in the European balance of power. In that same war, Spain lost vital territory like Florida to the British. How did they expect to regain from the British what they lost, and what role did the American colonies play in their plans for revenge against Britain? Well, as you said, both France and Spain um, lost quite a bit to the British. And the peace, which was signed in Paris in 1763, codified the enormous British Empire, which now existed across mm -hmm. the globe. Britain had Canada, they had Florida, um, they were a presence in many places that proved to be a real thorn in the side of both countries. And even before the ink was quite dry on the treaty that ended the war, they were making plans on how to exact revenge against Britain. And that was actually the word that was in the correspondence between those two cousins. And this is the part that I actually found in the archives in France and Spain. Um, they decided that they would uh, exchange engineers and shipbuilders and artillery engineers to create a common fleet where all the ships and all the artillery looked almost identical. It was sort of a NATO mm -hmm. before NATO. And they began building that up um, right away. They knew it was going to take them several years before they had a force big enough to contest the British. So they were also looking for another way of getting Britain's um, uh, power base 
to uh, be diminished not by direct conflict, but by encouraging or at least finding out when their colonial powers might see some kind of rebellion mm -hmm. against their authority. And both France and Spain were sending spies to what is now the United States, mm -hmm. to the, then the British colonies, uh, as early as 1765, just a couple of years after the war, mm -hmm. to take the temperature to see when the Americans might rebel. Because uh, in the words of the French foreign minister at the time, um, only a future American rebellion will uh, diminish uh, Britain's power. And that was pretty much the idea of both France and Spain. They would uh, contest the British on the open ocean with their uh, more powerful navies, mm -hmm. but at the same time make use of an American rebellion, which they saw coming even before we did, as a way to also weaken Britain's power. Now, Larry, you talk in your book about French minister Comte de Vergennes. Who exactly was Comte de Vergennes, and what role did he play in having France assist the Americans? And what about his Spanish counterpart, Florida de Blanca? The Comte de Vergennes was the French foreign minister under Louis XVI, and he was the most important character in this whole story because he determined what the overall French goals of the uh, entering into the conflict would be. And Vergen was quite practical. He had a very France first attitude. Mm -hmm. He knew that the goal of um, the French military uh, and Navy together would be to knock the uh, status of Britain down to the point where France could then reoccupy the um, uh, center of power in Europe. So he did not necessarily want to destroy Britain, but uh, actually push them back away from uh, any other alliances. So he had to not only uh, help the American rebels who were fighting against Britain, but also keep juggling all the power politics that were going on in Europe at the same time. And this was an amazing juggling act because um, he did not want Britain to have any other allies. And during the entire war, they did not get any other military allies against the Americans. He was trying to keep Russia from interfering in European politics. He was also trying to keep uh, Spain, who had its own interests, um, involved in the war. And that meant that uh, his counterpart, who was the Spanish foreign minister, Florida Blanca, also had to have um, his interests taken into account. Spain had very specific material and geographical interests. Its, um, its possession, Gibraltar, had been taken by the British mm -hmm. many years before, and Spain wanted it back. So the goal of Spain in uh, fighting Britain was always going to be recovering Gibraltar, also recovering several other territories that the British had, including the island of Menorca in the Mediterranean, and recovering Florida, mm -hmm. because Florida was one of the keys to the Gulf of Mexico. And keep mm -hmm. in mind that at the time, the Gulf of Mexico was, for Spain, the main route that its silver convoys traveled when mm -hmm. going from Mexico and Peru back to the mother country. Having mm -hmm. the British in any possession of territories around the Gulf of Mexico was a enormous thorn in the side from Spain, for Spain. Mm -hmm. So. Vergen and Florida Blanca had to balance their specific national interests uh, in what they wanted to gain out of this war with their commitments to the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Now, in your book, you talk about a lot of behind the scenes activities. For example, what role did merchants like Gardoque, Beaumarchais, and Silas Dean play in providing guns and supplies to the Americans? When the war broke out in 1775, uh, both France and Spain did not have the naval capability of immediately going to war with Britain. They knew that by supplying arms and, and uh, uh, gunpowder and other kinds of uh, supplies to the Americans, they could keep the Americans fighting while they were building up their own militaries. But they could not overtly provide any kind of materiel to the Americans without raising the ire of Britain and risking going mm -hmm. into war. Mm 
So they used merchants like Diego de Gardoqui, who was uh, the Spanish merchant, and uh, uh, Caron de Beaumarchais, who was the French merchant, to hide the source of these arms. Now in the case of the Spanish, those arms were being provided um, through the Spanish possession of New Orleans and Louisiana, and the primarily traveling up the Mississippi River to mm -hmm. help the Americans who were fighting in the Western theater along the Mississippi all the way to Detroit. But for the Americans on the, uh, who were in, primarily involved on the East Coast, New York, mm -hmm. uh, Boston, etc., cetera, uh, those arms were coming uh, directly from France and they were being done at the behest of the Continental Congress who sent their envoy, Silas Dean, who was a merchant from New England, mm -hmm. to negotiate for arms um, even before there was any kind of treaty arrangement with France. Dean has been largely left out of our American history books. Few people today even know who he is or what contributions he made to American independence. He did grow up in Connecticut. Born in Groton, he was the son of a blacksmith. He graduated from Yale, became an attorney, and a member of the Connecticut General Assembly. Now, Dean and Franklin were actually pretty good friends. In fact, it was Franklin who convinced the Continental Congress to send Dean over to France to solicit French aid, if possible, by seeking arms and supplies on credit. Franklin knew that Dean, if anyone, could make that happen. When Dean met Beaumarchais, things clicked between them immediately. They instantly liked each other, and what emerged was, was the smuggling company set up by Beaumarchais, Rodrigo Hortalis, that began to smuggle the arms, the ammunition, the tents, the uniforms, the money, the supplies, to America. Most people did not really know that it was Dean, and not Franklin, who was the one most responsible for bringing most of the international military advisors to the American cause. Lafayette, DeKalb, Pulaski, and many others came as a result of Dean's efforts in many instances long before Franklin arrived in France to assist Dean. In fact, Dean and Beaumarchais had been working together for well over 10 months before Franklin arrived in France in December of 1776. Silas Dean negotiated directly with Beaumarchais. All of this keep in mind with the uh, tacit approbation of the French government in the form of Vergennes. And Vergennes um, not only provided the initial seed money for these arms purchases to be made by the Americans because the Americans did not have the money at the time to front to Beaumarchais. Silas Dean was essentially handing them a letter of credit. Um, the arms that Beaumarchais was able to collect from around France and bring to the United States, which included thousands and thousands of muskets, cannon, gunpowder, all the things that the Americans lacked, really helped turn the tide in the early part of the war against the British, who'd been winning almost all of the battles up until that point. But when uh, a shipment of arms came from France and landed on the American shores in 1776 and 1777, that meant the Americans, who were fighting a rear guard action against the British in New York, were able to have enough arms to make a stand against the British at Saratoga defeat the British and knock the, uh, the, the, the royals back on their heels. Beaumarchais was the top advisor to King Louis XVI of France, and although he came from a watchmaking family, he was really a playwright by profession. He wrote The Marriage of Figaro, which was later put to music by Mozart. He also wrote The Barbara Seville and The Guilty Mother. But his greatest contribution was really as an arms dealer, the ultimate French smuggler of French goods to America. Now, France didn't support the American independence because they believed in mom apple pie and the flag and freedom and justice. They backed our efforts because they wanted to seek revenge, to get back at England for being humiliated, really, in the Seven Years' War. And if France was successful in helping the American colonies break away from England, they would know, basically would be helping establish 13 or more new economic trading opportunities. No longer would France or other nations be subject to the British Navigation Acts, which really controlled all American trade in the... British colonies. Now Beaumarchais knew this from the outset and Dean knew it as well. Beaumarchais convinced the French king that the best way to help the Americans, hopefully without the British learning of French activity in this area, was really to quietly smuggle arms, ammunition, tents, uniforms, medicine, and money to the American colonies. The Americans would basically buy on credit. 
credit which they really didn't have. And in turn, the Americans would smuggle it to France, indigo and rice from the Carolinas, tobacco from Virginia, and lumber from New England. Now, at the outset, much of this smuggling worked, done through a dummy company set up by Beaumarchais called Rodrigo Hortalis et Compagnie, until the British began to successfully blockade and control the major ports in the north, which would be New York and Providence, and of course in the south, Savannah, Charleston, and Wilmington. As a result, Yorktown, Virginia, the largest tobacco port in the colonies, became the major hub of French-American smuggling via the Chesapeake Bay. Apart from the guns and the supplies, what did the Americans actually say they wanted from France and Spain? Did that match with what the French and the Spanish finally provided? At first, the Americans wanted um, a navy, and they wanted uh, only a, a handful of people uh, to volunteer as uh, engineers and artillery specialists. Um, the, neither France nor Spain was going to provide a navy to the United States. As it turned out, the Continental Navy, which was built specifically to uh, make direct economic attacks against the British, turned out to be an annoyance and not in any way a, uh, a significant impediment to British naval operations. But what the Americans wanted in the way of uh, volunteers absolutely did not match what the French and the uh, French primarily were able to provide. The Americans had plenty of soldiers. In fact, at the very beginning of the war, they had more militia on the ground across all 13 colonies than the British had uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. What they did not know how to do at the time was conduct the kind of land war that the British were used to, including sieges and fortifications. And the Americans wanted engineers. So um, France was able to send um, a handful of engineers to help with creating um, fortifications, creating siege um, lines that, to attack the British. But the majority of the volunteers who came over in the early part of the war were um, officers and um, uh, lower ranking, primarily of mm -hmm. lower ranks, who wanted to fight the British. And America was the only place that the British were to fight. And mm -hmm. General Washington had a real problem on his hands because many of these French officers who had a lot of experience wanted a, um, a place in the American lines, but he did not have the authority, which was really granted by the Congress, to commission these officers as generals or even as a high ranking, uh, uh, or even give them the, the high rank. So he was faced with a big problem for the first part of the war. Um, eventually that was overcome when these volunteers showed themselves not just to be um, looking for position, but they proved to be a very effective fighting force in battles like Brandywine, which really mm -hmm. showed um, how brave and also how intrepid um, these uh, immigrants who got the job done, as the uh, musical Hamilton said, how just brave and intrepid they really could be. Mm -hmm. Now you say in your book that naval power was the greatest contribution from France and Spain. Why was that? And did the Americans see it that way? The Americans knew that Britain's greatest strength was its navy. It could not keep 20,000 uh, soldiers who were um, primarily in New York City supplied by foraging because, of course, the entire rest of the mm -hmm. um, landscape was inhabited by primarily patriots who were not willing to give the British supplies readily. Um, and the British also needed uh, naval power not just to bring supplies from England, but also to move troops from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. um, I already mentioned that uh, one of the first things they were looking to get was a navy from France and Spain, and they mm -hmm. were not going to be able to get that. Mm -hmm. The Americans tried to build um, ships, but that was never the problem. Americans were very capable of building ships, but they did not have the maritime tradition of manning and maintaining a navy, which involves an enormous amount of manpower on many different fronts. Uh, what was really the game changer for the Americans, um, even though they were fighting primarily on land, was when the French came into the war after they signed a treaty with the Americans in 1778. And one of the first actions 
was a, a convoy of um, ships from France led by the Comte d'Estaing, which meant that the uh, British no longer ruled the waves in the North American waters. With the French Navy now in North American territory, the first thing that the British had to do was consolidate all their troops, by, by which mm -hmm. time, by the way, they had occupied Philadelphia and they were uh, in many other places. They had to consolidate back to New York, otherwise they would be blockaded. Their supply routes were now being cut off, and also they could not move troops from one location to the other very readily. So suddenly the British, which were quite used to having a combined naval army campaign, now had to resort to uh, land power alone. And that was a real change for um, the British mm -hmm. in terms of their strategic uh, <coughs> capabilities. Mm -hmm. Now, apart from the Marquis de Lafayette, Americans know very little of other foreign soldiers and sailors who fought against the British. Can you name a few and tell us what they accomplished? I'm going to start on the Spanish side because that, up until recently, has received the least recognition. And I'll start with somebody who's been gaining notoriety, uh, and rightly so, and that's Bernardo de Galvez, who mm -hmm. was just recently made an honorary citizen of the United States by the Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, Galvez was the governor of Louisiana, which was by this point a Spanish territory. And in that capacity, he was helping to supply the Americans up the Mississippi River all the way to Detroit with arms and munitions and supplies. But um, I already mentioned that um, Spain uh, and France together were uh, a formidable navy. When Spain entered the war in 1779, um, that brought the Spanish Navy into the conflict. And that meant that the war was suddenly global. The French Navy by itself could contest the, the British in North America, but with the Spanish and the French together, they could contest the British all the way from the Caribbean to uh, India. Galvez was able to use that combination of French and Spanish power to immediately launch raids on Spanish Florida, which again was the key to the Gulf of Mexico. So right away he was able to take Natchez and Mobile and Baton Rouge, and then after a fairly drawn out um, campaign, he was with the uh, help of the French able to launch an, a combined amphibious assault on the British capital in Pensacola, capture Pensacola, and that brought all of uh, West Florida into mm -hmm. Spanish hands, and that removed that threat. Uh, another Spanish uh, volunteer who is better known f for the son that he um, had in the United States was Jordi Ferragut. And he had come over from Spain uh, right at the beginning of the war, saw that the uh, Americans were fighting the British, and because he was uh, quite um, anti-British because they had taken over his homeland, began fighting in what would turn out to be the battles of Savannah and Cowpens. Jordi Farragut's name is not known to the Americans, but his son David Farragut is known because mm -hmm. he became the highest ranking admiral, or the, rather the first um, four-star admiral in the American Navy, and he was one of the heroes of the Civil War. Let me quick go to, quickly go to the French side and, and name um, two people who uh, also are known to the Americans, but not as well as they should be. Uh, the, uh, the first one is Rochambeau, who mm -hmm. had come over in 1780 um, as part of a, uh, an agreed uh, deal with the Americans to supply, uh, or rather provide, an auxiliary force to Washington of a contingent of French soldiers. And they came under the leadership of Rochambeau, who was a seasoned veteran of wars against Britain. And together, Rochambeau and Washington made a very a good team because even though Rochambeau had far more experience than Washington, he knew that uh, Washington was in charge. He gave Washington advice when ne needed, followed orders when, when required, and they worked very well together. Mm -hmm. The other person was the Comte de Grasse. De Grasse was a fighting admiral who had um, uh, come over in 1781 from France, really with a fleet to protect the French possessions in the Caribbean. That's where the real strategic interest was. Most of the French um, uh, 
colonial um, economy was based in the Caribbean and it needed protecting from the British. But he had a window of opportunity to go to help Rochambeau and Washington during hurricane season in the Caribbean, which is September through November of 1781. And he was able to lead his um, entire fleet um, to the Chesapeake, not only to um, begin offloading supplies to help uh, them surround uh, Cornwallis at Yorktown, which of course we know was the, uh, one of the, the, the first um, uh, places the, American, uh, the Americans were significantly um, able to bring force to bear against the British. Um, but also, he was able to fight a battle against the British fleet, the vaunted British Navy, keep them out of the Chesapeake, and keep the British fleet from either resupplying or um, taking Cornwallis out of the Chesapeake. So it was the naval battle of the Chesapeake that really set the stage for the eventual battle at Yorktown to be won by the combined mm -hmm. uh, forces of Washington and Rochambeau. And otherwise, that's called the Battle of the Capes, as we also know it. Correct. Now, Larry, I understand from the very beginning that the French were somewhat reluctant. They had been defeated in the Seven Years' War. They were not supposed to rebuild their army. They were not supposed to rebuild their navy. I know that Virgins was hearing uh, sounds of rebellion in the colonies. And so I understand that as he sent some spies over here to try to gather information. And as I understand it, they met with Ben Franklin and John Jay late at night in Carpenter's Hall to get a feel for whether or not the Americans could really gather support from the French. When he received that information, what was the motivating factor for him to quietly go behind the scenes and approach perhaps Pierre Augustine Caron Beaumarchais? There's an interesting backstory that is quite unexpected. Um, the real motivation for Vergen to start supplying the Americans with arms was to prevent um, a, uh, of, uh, an outbreak of fighting between, of all countries, Spain and Portugal. And mm. the, um, the thing that Vergen, as the power broker in Europe, did not want to see after the devastating Seven Years' War was another, mm. you know, another war in Europe. And at the time, <clears throat> both Spain and Portugal had colonies in South America. And each, one, each colony, which was, uh, was, was, which was bordering on the other, were fighting over specific parts of their territory. And uh, by 1774, 1775, uh, each nation was rattling its saber, saying, I'm going to mm -hmm. attack the other. The problem with um, Portugal was it was uh, even, so Spain was backed by France. Portugal was backed by Britain. And if Portugal could depend upon Britain to provide it with arms and, and other power, they could conceivably go to war against Spain. So Vergen knew that if he could keep the Americans fighting against the British, because by this time, the Americans were already starting their insurgencies. If he could keep the British occupied in North America, they wouldn't have the ability or the interest of supplying troops and arms and naval power to Portugal. So if he could pull the stops out or pull the rug out from under Portugal, there would not be a war between Portugal and Spain. Portugal would simply not try mm -hmm. to foment a conflict. And so that was the initial reason why he was supplying arms. That quickly <coughs> evolved uh, within uh, a, a very short amount of time to a larger plan to keep those arms flowing so that they could build up their military, France and Spain together, and mm -hmm. re enact the revenge that they'd been planning for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. American history books and even American standards of learning cite the fact that Saratoga is the turning point of the American Revolution. I unequivocally dispute that for a variety of reasons, one of which being the simple fact that the French, I maintain, got involved many, many months, if not several years before the Battle of Saratoga. The French actually jumped in with both feet to help the Americans long before Franklin or Saratoga were factors. Ten months before Ben Franklin ever arrived in France, Silas Dean had already been working with Beaumarchais to smuggle supplies to the Americans. Seven months actually before Saratoga, but no troops. Washington wanted French troops to come to the aid of his army, 
but his troops didn't feel the same way. And Comte de Vergennes knew that Americans and French could not get along, so he allowed Beaumarchais to send other forms of aid instead. After the British defeat at Saratoga, however, it provided leverage to Dean and Franklin to convince the King and Virgins to send troops. The first French troops, however, failed twice to work with the Americans during the battles of Newport, Rhode Island in 1778 and Savannah in 1779, and although the French continued to supply the Americans with military aid, the Americans didn't win a single major battle after Saratoga for 35 months, just one month shy of three years. Now granted, 90% of the arms that the Americans used at Saratoga were from the French and perhaps from the Spanish as well. But in fact, they did not commit troops until after Saratoga. Would you explain the importance of what the French did right before that led up to Saratoga to demonstrate the fact, if you agree, that in fact France and Spain got involved long before Saratoga? They were certainly involved um, in the Americans' eyes with um, providing the kinds of guns and uh, gunpowder and other supplies necessary to keep the fight going. So when the Battle of Saratoga was fought, um, that gave uh, Vergen the pretext that he needed to commit uh, an entire army and an entire Troops. naval force to the effort. Because even though the Americans had won at Saratoga, they'd been losing a lot of their uh, other battles. And by, the point, by this point in the war, the British knew that the French were already involved. Mm -hmm. And the one thing Vergen could not tolerate was a reconstituted British Empire in North America, because that would threaten the French colonies in the Caribbean, which again was the source of a lot of their uh, um, uh, imperial wealth. So he knew that he had to commit French troops and a French naval force to keep the British out of North America. Saratoga simply gave uh, Vergen the mm -hmm. pretext to make the decision to form an alliance that he'd already come to. To me, the real turning point of the war was the entry of Spain into the fight. Because as I had already mentioned, it was always going to be a naval war. Because if you're fighting Britain and it's the 18th century, mm -hmm. it's a naval war because Britannia rules the waves. When Spain came in with France, the two navies were larger than the British Navy, and together they threatened not just the, um, the British in North America, they also threatened the British colonies in the Caribbean, which was also a major source of imperial wealth. They also threatened the British Isles themselves, that is, an invasion. They threatened the British possessions of Gibraltar and Menorca. They threatened Britain all the way to India. Britain, because of the entry of Spain, uh, meant that they had to divide their forces all over the globe and they were overwhelmed. And it was that naval power, um, that combined alliance w against a single power which had no allies whatsoever in Europe that really changed the nature of the war mm -hmm. from a territorial conflict <clears throat> in a small chunk of North America to a global war. Let's talk about that Spanish-French invasion of England. Now we know John Paul Jones, an American privateer, was basically charged with the responsibility of creating a diversion up at Whitehaven and to try to distract the British from where in fact an invasion might land. Uh, Admiral Cordoba was in the forefront of working with the Spanish and the French in invading England. Talk about that Spanish Armada. The original idea of invading Britain had uh, actually been talked uh, of and even attempted several times over the history of the French-Spanish Bourbon Alliance. In 1762, they were actually uh, contemplating a, an invasion as the way of knocking the British back on their heels. The problem was they could never coordinate their navies. By uh, 1779, the two navies had been <clears throat> built up because of 10 years of preparation of exchanging engineers and, um, and naval constructors and artillerymen, again, uh, what I had uh, first discovered when I did my initial research, uh, to the point where they knew they could uh, overwhelm the British forces in the channel and potentially land troops on the British coast. So that was the initial plan, was going to be a knockout blow. Um, the problem was, once they formed their navy, 
um, together and started to make their way up the coast to the English Channel. And uh, in numbers that really would have been overwhelming, overmatching for the British, they were hit by an outbreak of dysentery, which turned out to be one of the worst outbreaks of the disease in over a century. And on confined ships, uh, there is no avoiding um, the, uh, the devastating effects of transmittable uh, infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. That disease quickly laid low entire crews of entire ships to the point where the um, commanding um, officer of the entire fleet, Sun, uh, died because of the disease. His flagship was so devastated they had to strip other ships of their crew just to keep the flagship manned. By the time the fleet entered into British waters, it, they were floating hospitals. They mm -hmm. couldn't fight and they just had to um, disengage from the, from the battle just to be able to maneuver home. And it was disease, not, um, not fighting, that really spelled the end mm -hmm. of that attempted uh, French-Spanish invasion. Mm -hmm. Now before the French and Spanish alliance, Florida Blanca uh, was proposing a truce uh, between the British and the French in return for Gibraltar. What was the importance of Gibraltar? Why was Spain so interested in acquiring or reacquiring Gibraltar? What you've brought up is, uh, to me, one of the most interesting parts of this entire story. Every nation that fought in the war fought because they had a very specific um, interests that had nothing to do with American independence. France did not uh, fight alongside the Americans and, and form an alliance because it felt bad for the Americans. It wasn't done out of altruism. Spain did not decide to fight in the war because um, it saw the uh, American cause as being noble. Every nation entered into the war because it had a very specific national interest. Florida Blanca's national interest, as you said, was to recover Gibraltar. Gibraltar, which is of course that um, little piece of uh, Spain right at the mouth of the um, entrance to the Mediterranean from the Atlantic or the mm -hmm. entrance of the Atlantic to, from the Mediterranean, uh, was a key strategic uh, piece because it controlled a choke point, meaning all ships and traffic had to pass there. When Britain took that uh, piece of land in 1704, uh, it actually meant that it could control quite a bit of what Spain thought was its own geography, that uh, flow of traffic between uh, the two oceans. That was always going to be a thorn in the side of Spain, and so they always wanted it back. Even though it was a tiny speck of land, its strategic importance far outweighed its size. So uh, what Florida Blanca saw as an opportunity was if Britain could be induced to give up Gibraltar, Spain would not fight in the war that France had already engaged in, nor would it um, supply the Americans anymore, because it would be able to achieve its own war aims, recover that strategic piece of territory without shedding an ounce of blood or spending a Spanish eight, Spanish dollar, in, in fighting the British. Unfortunately for the Spanish, that did not come to pass because the British too saw that strategic bit of land as so important that they would not give it up. And there is every indication that had Spain not gotten into the war alongside France, uh, the war would have gone quite differently. It's no exaggeration to say that Britain gave up all of the United States for that little speck of rock called Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. When we were talking, when you were talking specifically about some of the other officers that were involved in the war and, and soldiers that were involved from France and, and Spain's perspective, and we were specifically talking about Rochambeau. Before Rochambeau came over here, there was an initial French expedition uh, spearheaded by the Comte de Stang, who arrived in April of 1778 with about 4,000 troops, but for some reason he couldn't seem to work with the Americans. He was involved, as you know, with uh, the attack on uh, Newport, Rhode Island to try to retake that from the British, and then later he came back from the islands a year later to try to retake Savannah. Uh, 
why wasn't the Stang able to work with the Americans? Was it a personality issue? Was it, a, was it tactics or just simply disagreements between the American commanders, General John Sullivan at Newport, and then later Benjamin Lincoln in Savannah? There's a larger lesson in the comparison between what de Stang was not able to accomplish and what Rochambeau, and then of course with de Grasse, was able to accomplish. Because when de Stang first uh, was sent, he had a letter from his king that said, I want you to go to the Americans and show them how the benevolence of the French king can help them and uh, show to the Americans how we can free them from the tyranny of the British. There was no coordination with the Americans whatsoever. The Americans mm -hmm. did not even know that he was coming. Mm -hmm. So when he arrived, he found that the situation on the ground, um, or rather on the ocean, was not what he expected. Um, he thought he would be able to first destroy the British fleet in New York. It turned out that both the geography and the strategic um, situation were not what he expected. No battle plan survives first contact with the enemy, as we all know. Um, then when he changed tactics to come to Newport, again, there was absolutely no coordination with the Americans because it had not been discussed with the Americans in the first place. There was no supply base available to the French. They weren't quite sure what their overall goal should be. The same also happened in Savannah, no coordination. De Stang finally had to go back to France. Uh, he did have uh, great victories in the Caribbean in the interim where he recovered several mm -hmm. islands from the British and put them back into French hands. So the French saw it as a victory. Well, this really um, changed the tone of the French involvement. And when Rochambeau came in 1780, he had already um, uh, uh, been given orders that specifically said, you are going to fight under George Washington. You are going to follow his orders. The question to George Washington of, would you like some soldiers to fight alongside you, had already been posed and answered in the affirmative. The amount of coordination, and cooperation, and materiel that the French soldiers would need had already been decided upon. It was a much more balanced and coordinated effort the second time around. Think about it this way, um, Rochambeau was leading a, an army that was better trained, better equipped mm -hmm. than uh, Washington's Americans. And yet, he mm -hmm. allowed himself to be put under the command of George Washington. Now that was an enormous seeding of power, and yet politically it was absolutely necessary. And by letting the Americans take the lead and fight the battle that was really theirs to begin with, that spelled victory for both sides. Mm -hmm. Larry, why were the French and the Spanish written out of the history of the American Revolution? The curious thing is the earliest histories of the American Revolution, which were being written as the battles were being fought, or rather the last battles, made uh, a point of including how important the French battles, the Spanish battles, and, and the other conflicts uh, aside were to the overall um, campaigns. But over time, the, both the French and the Spanish were slowly written out of the story. I think the most important um, event was the, um, the Manifest Destiny movement, which began in the 1840s and uh, made the expansion of America westward kind of a, a political and uh, almost a, a moral uh, imperative for mm -hmm. the Americans. And if you think about um, what stood in the way of the westward expansion of the Americans, it was either the Spanish themselves or their, uh, the remnants of their empire, Mexico in, in particular. And one historian in particular, George Bancroft, who really was the uh, premier historian mm -hmm. of the 19th century, uh, wrote a 10-volume um, treatise of American history that was almost a million words and became the basis of almost everybody else's histories, was particularly um, uh, vitriolic when it came to the Spanish. Um, so as you saw other history books making reference to uh, the roles of France and Spain, you saw Spain's role 
quite quickly being um, either lambasted or actually disappeared from mm -hmm. the entire account. And of course, Lafayette, who had made a trip to the United States in the uh, 1820s and really cemented his reputation as the hero of two worlds, mm -hmm. his name became the unique one associated with um, foreign uh, participation, specifically French. So it took those kinds of uh, events to uh, steadily diminish uh, the roles of uh, the, the um, foreign participants. Now, if you think about history as politics by other means, mm -hmm. if you uh, understand how our history is changing, today we are very much in a globalized economy, but we're also a lot more cognizant of the role that our own immigrants have played in our history. We're not just a nation who came from the British colonies, but we were, in fact, uh, um, you know, part of a set of empires, mm -hmm. all of which had a role to play. That's why I think the histories that we're starting to see come uh, out today, mm -hmm. mine but many others, uh, are playing up the roles of all these other participants, France and Spain in, in, in particular, in our overall history and specifically in the creation of our country. Well, what's the one takeaway, the one thing that Americans really need to know about the international dimension of the American Revolution? The myth that the American uh, people uh, fought the British and won independence by ourselves was always wrong and it was never a good fit. It didn't describe who we were as a people and it certainly, certainly does not describe who we are as a people today. America could not have won the war without France. France would never have fought the war without Spain. Mm -hmm. And it was only by this international coalition with America at its center were we able to gain a victory over a common enemy. And if you think about who we are today, um, the fact that America continues to be the centerpiece of international alliances that all work together mm -hmm. to create a common good, that what is what continues to mark us even today as the indispensable nation. Many states are beginning to form commissions to celebrate the 250th anniversary of American independence, which technically would go to, you know, 2031 if we ended it near the Treaty of Paris and the Battle of Yorktown, the last significant battle in America. What should we be doing in America to recognize the contributions of Spain and France during that period? Uh, should we begin to uh, do events that relate to educating Americans about the role of France and Spain? The most important thing we can do for the year 2026 would be to re-envision the Declaration of Independence, which is the first thing we're, that we're going to be celebrating, mm -hmm. not as a signal to George III that we wanted independence, because that's not why the Declaration of Independence was written in the first place. The Americans knew that George III had already uh, seen the Americans fighting to break away from America. He'd already gotten the memo. We didn't need to tell him. We didn't write the Declaration of Independence to tell the American citizens that we were becoming an independent nation because keep in mind, all of the colonies sent their delegates to Philadelphia to declare for independence in the first place. So we knew. I would like to see the Declaration of Independence be re-envisioned in the history books, in the studies of uh, everyone from college all the way to grade school, in discussions uh, at the highest levels of um, academia and government as a call to arms, as a signal to the French and the Spanish crowns that we were serious, we want to uh, fight the British, uh, we need your help, and we are now a sovereign nation asking your help to come alongside and fight us. Because when you read the descriptions of the um, debates leading to the Declaration, that's what becomes clear. Every delegate understood mm -hmm. that the Declaration was being written as a clear signal, an engraved invitation, saying, we know that you're not going to fight France and Spain in a civil war. So we're telling you that we are now an independent sovereign nation 
and you can come alongside us and fight as you would with any other sovereign nation against that common enemy, the British crown, and be assured that we will fight with everything we have and we will not give up. What did France and Spain gain as well as what did they lose during the American Revolution? The interesting re thing about the Treaty of, um, well, there were two treaties, uh, Paris and Versailles, mm -hmm. signed on the same day in 1783 that codified the end of the American Revolution, the War of Independence. And the reason it was signed is every single side got what it was looking for. Britain actually, in many ways, won the war in that they maintained their maritime empires. They had already figured out that keeping the United States was a losing proposition. They could get what they were looking for simply by trade. So they were happy to keep their maritime power and maritime empires, which were in the Caribbean all the way to India. And by the way, a lot of the uh, imperial uh, vision was already shifting towards India and the Asian and the, and the Asian regime as the next source of imperial wealth and power. So Britain got what it wanted. America, of course, got independence, so it got what it wanted. France saw Britain knocked back on its heels in Europe, so it regained its center of the balance of power in Europe. And Spain, although it did not recover Gibraltar, was able to recover Florida and Menorca and a few other territories, so it got what it wanted. There were um, also, by the way, two other nations involved. Uh, the Dutch Republic was part of the uh, equation. They were able to retain their ability to um, navigate freely on the oceans, which is what they were fighting for. And even in India, the Kingdom of Mysore, uh, which was allied with the French, for a short time was able to dictate terms to the British for their defeat. Now that did not ultimately last, but for at least a, a brief period of time, every side got what it wanted out of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. How did the American Revolution relate or impact the French Revolution? There was some effect from the spending of France on the war as a whole against Britain it certainly ran into uh, debt at the government level and was having trouble paying it back. But so was Britain also in debt at the same time. And Britain was able to pay down its debt because it had very um, strong financial controls that uh, quickly paid down uh, outstanding debt through, the, uh, through government uh, taxes and funding. The interesting thing is the French also had a similar mechanism back after the Seven Years' War. It restricted the amount of government spending. It paid down through taxes and uh, other fees the, uh, the debt of the Seven Years' War. So by the time of the American Revolution, it was actually debt-free. The same situation did not arise after the War of American Independence ended. The bad practices of hiding um, debts in the French economy of using what were called tax farmers. These were independent agents mm -hmm. to collect taxes, as opposed to having the French government itself tax, uh, collect the taxes, which um, lent itself to a lot of corruption. All of these practices continue to pace, meaning that the French could not pay down um, the debt that had been accrued and continued to accrue debt because of other spending. So by the time 1788 and 1789, rolled around, mm -hmm. the overall French economy was doing quite well, but the French government itself could not collect the taxes to pay both the war debt and the accrued additional debt. And that, more than anything, led to the French Revolution. It had almost nothing to do with the American Revolution itself, either in terms of the debt or in terms of the idea that there was a revolutionary spirit um, sweeping across the, the countries. The curious thing also about the people who um, fought in the American Revolution and then went back to France is they fought for the French crown. So many of the officers who fought also during the French Revolution saw their allegiance not to the revolutionaries, but to the crown itself. Larry, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been my pleasure. Today we spoke with Dr. Larry Ferrara, author, 
of Brothers at Arms, American Independence, and the men of France and Spain who saved it. In subsequent interviews, we'll be discussing the men and women, battles and strategies and events of the real American Revolution. We'll examine the myths and the realities of what really happened in the real American Revolution. My name is Randy Flood. Thank you for watching.